A while back, I painted a Sister of Battle for an episode of Evie Metal Marines. Recently, someone reached out to buy this figure. That's amazing, except for one problem. The face is absolutely hideous. <coughs> if you are looking for the missing link, look no further. Crow Magnin, Sister Superior, at your service. I can't sell this and have it remind the buyer and anyone who sees it how bad I am at painting female faces, so we gotta redo it. Unfortunately for me, the face of this cave woman will live on forever on WarhammerCommunity.com, no matter how many times I repaint it. What a great painting debut on Games Workshop, the largest miniature manufacturer's premier blog. Sucks to suck, am I right? All right, enough with the setup. Let's paint the mini painting version of plastic surgery. My first step was to strip off the old paint job. To ensure that I only targeted the face, I applied isopropyl alcohol to the head with a paintbrush and slowly brushed away the paint. It takes some time, but most of the paint will melt away after a few applications. Generally, people use Q-tips, but I find they don't have enough precision for a task like this, unless you use some of those fancy ones from Tamiya. These are great for doing a rougher, more accurate removal of paint. I will say that these Q-tips are surprisingly hard compared to the regular variety. If that still isn't working and you are struggling to remove tiny bits of paint like I was from the model's tear duct area, you can consider using some sharpened bamboo skewers. In my experience, bamboo isn't hard enough to damage the plastic of the model, but it allows you to scrape away some more annoying bits. As a last-ditch effort, you can use an old airbrush needle, but be warned, you might start scraping away the plastic of the model, so you need to be really careful when doing this for precise paint removal. With the paint removed successfully, I began painting. I started with an old Citadel Foundation paint skin tone, Talarin Flesh. This is my personal favorite flesh color. It's a good mixture of hues and values. Not too yellow, not too red, not too bright, not too dark. On my previous attempt painting this face, I started with a very dark base coat. That darkness stuck around in the recesses of the model, defining the mouth and the lips. Defining these areas is okay, but with a dark color like this one, it ages and makes the face look much more masculine. Learning from that, we'll start brighter. From this starting point, I mixed an off-white yellow into my mid-tone to start to develop my highlights. I'm focusing my highlights on the chin, lips, upper cheeks, bridge of the nose, individual nostrils, and what little part of the forehead is visible through the bangs. On my first attempt painting this face, I accidentally misinterpreted part of the sculpt as forehead when it was supposed to be hair. That likely made her forehead look bigger, contributing to her unintentional masculinity. I slowly mixed more and more yellow into the skin tone to get brighter and brighter highlights. Every once in a while, it's a good idea to clean up the surrounding area, in this case, her black hair, to get a better idea of how you're progressing along. Sometimes when something is surrounded by a lot of unintentional, half-opaque brushstrokes, it can look a lot worse than it actually is. With some rudimentary contrast in place, I started to work on the eyes. On the previous attempt, the eyes appeared as though they were different in size and also angled differently. This time around, I'm going to be mindful of that and try to shape the eyes with my paints in a more pleasant way. I started by filling the eyes with a very dark red color. This will separate the white of the eye from the skin tone, but also act as something of an eyeliner, depending on how intentional we are with it. Intentional in this case means how dark it is. The darker it is, the more it'll appear to be makeup. The lighter it is, the more it'll appear to be normal shadow on human skin. Considering I grew up in the early 2000s and this girl has big ass bangs, I'm gonna go pretty thick on the eyeliner and go full panic at the disco diva. For the white of the eye, I used an off-white. In a previous video, I used a color called Thar Brown, but I was working on a bust. For a miniature of this scale, I'd use Thar Brown again, but with some white mixed in. In my experience, if you don't go bright enough with the white of the eyes on a 32mm miniature, they get lost in the face, especially after you add the iris, which is our next step. Similar to the whites, the iris needs to be sufficiently dark so that it shows up. If all the details of the eye are too close in value, it tends to bleed together a little bit. Lastly, I tried to add in a specular highlight, but I kind of always struggle to do that on models of this scale. It's hard to differentiate the specular highlight from the white of the eye, having them both read separately. While I did try, I think it just blended with the white of the eye, making my iris smaller. It's worth mentioning that I repainted the eyes at least three times to make sure that the recess shade around the eye was sufficiently thin and that the irises were aligned and not goofy looking. Very often, I am unable to nail the eyes on the first shot, and you probably aren't either, and that's totally normal and okay. I'm working with very small, thin layers of paint, so I can give us a fair number of tries before starting to see paint build up. I moved on from the eyes and started to add some warmth to the cheeks with some glazes of red. 
Red not only enlivens the skin after several rounds of highlights that can sometimes desaturate the flesh, but also it darkens it down. Applying it to the temples or the cheekbones slims the face. I've learned from traditional art that bright colors tend to jump out of the canvas at you and dark colors recede. If we focus our highlights on the center of the face and our shadows around the outside, we reduce the perceived width of the face. Before moving on to the next part, let's hear a brief word from our sponsor. Frontier Wargaming makes portable painting stations. They come in several sizes and price points, but today we're looking at the newest offering on their site, the paint chest. Let's see what kind of booty is inside. This thing can pack a whopping 256 Vallejo paints or 144 Citadel paints when fitted with the default shelves, but those numbers can be increased by 150% if you use only paint shelves. I kind of feel bad for the intern who had to sit there and figure that out. 145, 146, 140... Damn it! What I like about the paint chest is you can make it whatever you want it to be. Do you need to bring rattle cans along? There's a custom shelf for that. Do your minions have magnets in the bases and can benefit from a magnetic tray? They got you covered. You get your tray of miniature holders, numerous boxes for a variety of tools, a handle or strap for carrying, and a light all built into the paint chest. The dimensions of each slot are shared so you can mix and match all the options Frontier Wargaming has based on what works for you. The storage capacity of this thing is so massive that I imagine some people could permanently keep their hobby supplies in this box and break it out whenever they need, keeping it comfortably stowed away in the meantime, just in case you need to hide your nerdy hobby from your new girlfriend. Heck, you can even put in a custom engraving on the front of this box, so just in case you want to stare at upside down glasses guy whenever you hobby, you can. For the meme, I'll supply a free SVG of his face in the description of this video, just in case. If you're looking for something smaller in size, Frontier Wargaming has a paint case 2.0 with similar features. Lastly, with the coupon code MINIAC2021, you get 10 bucks off your purchase from their website. Thanks to Frontier Wargaming for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to turning ape looking lady into human looking lady. My next step was hard to describe. I began futzing, fixing little problems here and there. I felt like I was making very little progress. I think it's time to bring in a professional. I had a chat with Kat Martin. Kat is a phenomenal miniature painter with accolades to back it up. She paints primarily female subjects and is also a female. Go figure. I reasoned that if anyone would be able to get me out of my endless futzing cycle, it would be her. By the way, if you want to check out Kat's art, give her a follow on Instagram and check out her Etsy store if you want some prints of her amazing illustrations. I'll have both linked in the description. I began by showing her a picture of where we started and where we were, and her initial reaction surprised me. She described my cavewoman sister of battle as... Badass? What do you mean, badass, Cat? You're supposed to tell me this paint job looks like a half ape, half human warrior monk. The implications here are twofold. One, whenever giving feedback, praising the paint job in some way makes your feedback easier to receive. Keep that in mind whenever you give feedback to someone. And two, if there was a warrior female in the 41st millennium who had been chiseled down by years of vicious combat, they'd probably look like this. Without even realizing it, I was setting a standard for female beauty, even in the grimmest and darkest storyline that there is. The issue that I'm trying to solve shouldn't be making this paint job look more feminine, it should be making it better, however that is defined. Luckily for me, Kat is going to define it because I clearly have no idea what I'm doing. <coughs> the first thing she mentioned was adjusting the eyes. There wasn't enough white on the right side of the iris. She looked a little cross-eyed. I added some eye white color to the left side of the iris, which made it smaller, but also centered it. Next on Kat's list was to hide the parts of the face that were important. She mentioned that I should make the philtrum, also called Cupid's arrow, the upper lip effectively, brighter, keeping a little shadow in the middle. I also should brighten up the bridge of the entire nose. I tend to focus too much on the end of the nose and the nostrils. She also said to hide the area of the skin near the tear ducts, or the mediale. Those new highlights combined with the chin highlight I already had created what she called a heart-shaped face. The next bit of face knowledge Kat shared with me was about skin. I had focused all my warm tones down by the jawline, where in reality, the area above your cheekbones is where your skin is thinnest. This means it's easy to see redness here from the underlying blood. Kat also said it makes your model look cuter, and I agree, it is quite cute. Using thinned down red acrylic paint, I cheated the color up from the jawline onto the flesh of the cheek with several thin layers of paint. Next, let's talk lips. I honestly never know what to do with lips. Whenever I apply any amount of color to them, it looks like lipstick, and honestly, that's not what I'm going for the vast majority of the time. Insert Cap Martin wisdom here. 
with a mixture of brown, a warm color, and some water, and a bit of glazing on top of the lips that I'd already highlighted, you get a fairly realistic, low-impact lip color. What a simple and elegant mixture of colors. Time to go repaint some lips on hundreds of minis that I have slacked on. The best part of a lot of this painting advice is that it's sculpt agnostic. If your model doesn't have a little depression in its filtrum or it's missing its nostrils, you can shade and highlight it as though those things exist. And because they're so small, from two inches away, it'll appear as though the sculpt has those details. This is how you sculpt with your paintbrush. Lastly, Kat said to add some blue to the lower area of the face by the jawline. This reminded me of a face painting class I took at Adepticon with Ben Comets back in 2017. He demonstrated how the face could be divided into three portions. The top part is yellow because it's influenced by the warmth of the sun. The middle part is red because that's where the skin is thinnest and blood shows through easiest. And the bottom part is blue because it's reflecting the cool darkness of the ground below. These are referred to as color zones and are a pretty typical approach to painting faces in traditional art. When adding your cooling color, which doesn't have to be blue, it can be something like navy blue or green blue, you have to be careful. If you add too much, your female subject will look like she's growing a beard, which isn't what I was going for in this case. I honestly was a bit too sheepish at this step and probably could have done it more intensely to shape the face more. My last step before gluing her head on was to do a small cross freehand on the upper side of her left cheek, like you see in a lot of sisters. I used black ink in this situation because it's fairly opaque and also flows off my brush very nicely. With that last bit done, I could send off this miniature to a hopefully happier customer. I'm honestly amazed at how the five tips that Kat gave me impacted the face so much. She gave me concrete, tangible steps to take and told me how they affected the face and they did just that. A lot of art is very wishy-washy and as a former engineer, it's a difficult pill to swallow. I want to know that when I do something, a quantifiable result will occur. This unfortunately isn't always the case in art, but I felt like in this situation, it almost worked that way. Thank you again to Kat Martin for helping me achieve my goals. If you guys aren't following on Instagram, you definitely should. She's actually my favorite miniature painter here in the States. The best part about being a YouTuber with a larger channel is that I can use that as a backstage pass to talk to all the coolest painters that I admire, and Kat is definitely one of them. Hopefully this process of looking back at an old paint job and improving on it was helpful to you. Now the mystery of painting faces is a little less foggy. At some point in the future, I'd love to make a video about painting faces, but I feel like I'd need to audit a college course on portraiture before I personally feel comfortable creating a resource on it. I have a lot of backyard alleyway tips on how to paint a face, but nothing that's too fundamental. That's gonna do it for this video, guys. If you liked it, you can give it a thumbs up. If you like the channel and you wanna support it, there are a number of ways you can do it, like buying my model, the Duchess, and also the digital course that I made for it that can teach you how to paint the model step-by-step. You can also buy some merch and some hobby tools I recommend using my affiliate links, all things linked down in the description below. Lastly, if you guys are interested in a Kickstarter campaign that I am running at the beginning of next year, every single Monday I am sending out updates about the progress of the campaign through an emailing list. If you're interested in reading those updates, you can find a link to subscribe in the description below. Subscribe or die! But most importantly, don't forget to pay my minis!